good evening to you. It's one of many tragic stories to emerge from the scandal of contaminated blood. How 89 boys could be infected with HIV and hepatitis during routine treatment for haemophilia. But that's what happened to pupils at Trelaw School in North Hampshire during the 1970s and 80s. Since then, all but 17 have died in what's been described as the biggest medical disaster in the history of the NHS. Well, in total, tens of thousands of people were infected, but this week the public inquiry has been focusing on exactly what happened at Trelaws, which at the time specialised in caring for young haemophiliacs. Well, Rachel Hepworth has been at the inquiry in London for us, Rachel. Well, what happened at the school was described today as a tragedy within a tragedy. Around 100 boys, mostly known to each other, infected with hepatitis and HIV. Today, just a handful survive. Well, we've been hearing often harrowing evidence today from parents who've lost children and from former pupils. It's clear to see that the impact is still painfully evident. It's stigma, um, losing 72 friends, uh, school friends, um, who you've known since you were that high. I'm an angry old man now. It's just hard because, as I say, you lose all these people. Um, why? Well, that is the question that they all want answering. I joined Gary and some of his last remaining school friends as they made an emotional return to Trelaws. We used to zoom around here in a car. Yeah. It's been more than 40 years since they first arrived at Trelaws. And then there was the lift in front lift of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Still For young boys with haemophilia, the specialist boarding school in the countryside around Alton was a sanctuary. It was incredible. I've been haemophilia when you're young. You normally see hospital, home, sofa, and not much school. Suddenly we were at school, and it was just the most amazing place. The bonds and the friendships that were formed here were more than normal school friendships mm. and relationships. It became like blood brothers. I mean, we've obviously been referred to as the blood brothers, and I think that's how we all consider ourselves. I came here at the age of 10, um, and it was a completely new world from what I had before, which was hospitals, as Aid said, and you know, sleep, resting on the sofa and things like that. And you know, I got a good education, um, but something else happened. What happened was an NHS haemophilia centre attached to the school began to treat boys with a new clotting agent, Factor 8. On the surface, it seemed miraculous. Someone came along and said, Look, guys, rather than you having to go to hospital and hold your arm out and be there overnight for a long transfusion. You're going to have a 60 mil syringe that's going to take 10 minutes to, mm. to give yourself and then you can go back out and play football and yeah. basically do whatever you want. And of course, what, what eight, nine year old boy's not going to say, mm. yeah, I'll have that. What they didn't know was that Factor 8 was made from blood donated by groups at high risk of HIV and hepatitis, including drug addicts and prisoners in America. As early as 1975, boys began to fall ill. By the early 1980s, with the stigma of HIV at its highest, they began to receive devastating news. I came here when I was 12 years old, and I was uh, two years later. I was told I only had two years to live. The impact was a bomb. We'd had it. We were going to die. We, had, we were given two to three years to live and we were going to die. And most did. It was very, very difficult to see and to watch. Just after we left the college, that's what it was at its worst. By 1995, um, I'd lost 40 people that I knew. The word haemophilia became a dirty mm. word overnight, you know, you didn't reveal you were a haemophiliac to anybody. But there is another burden and that is of survivor's guilt um, because we have lost so many close school friends and uh, people that we thought were untouchables at the time um, and that is, that is a very hard pill to swallow. For years they thought they were alone. It has only been through decades of campaigning that the full extent of the scandal has become known. Up to 30,000 men, women and children believed to have been infected. Those who've survived have often suffered prolonged ill health, stigma and poverty. 
They hope the inquiry will bring answers and accountability, a promise made by the Trelaws boys 30 years ago. We made a pledge then that we'll see this through. If there's any everyone around, we'll find out and get to the truth. And that's why we're here today. They've been well supported by Trelaws, a pioneering and outstanding school. Windows in the chapel commemorate the pupils they lost. It will never be forgotten. It's obviously a, just a cause of such sorrow to us that, that the infected blood scandal touched them and their time at, at, at Trelaws. Been through it together, we've, oh, we've yeah. shared the pain, yeah. the sadness, the disappointment, the frustration, the anger. We all felt it. Yeah. There's all the people that should be here, and they're not here, and they should be. Um, and it's a lot of responsibility for us all to carry, um, and for their families. And there are people that are still now hiding away and, and can't speak up. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to treasure their memory and make sure that we carry it as best as we can. Well, that is exactly what they are doing throughout this inquiry. The distinctive ties, incidentally, are a constant reminder. Yellow uh, for hepatitis, red for HIV and black for all those who they have lost. Next month, we hope to hear evidence from senior health officials from the time, including Kenneth Clark. Some answers, we hope, after all these years. Rachel Hepworth in London. Thank you.